Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. And on this episode, I'm talking about something that I really don't talk about enough. That is jury nullification. I think the last time I really covered it in any detail was an episode that I did like a deep dive on it about a year and a half ago. I will link to that episode in the show notes and talk about it in this episode as well because it's got a lot of great info. But I'm going to do today, I'm going to do a quick overview of of what jury nullification is from the best organization on the planet in regards to this important tool to protect liberty. That's the Fully Informed Jury Association at FIJA, F-I-J-A dot org. And then I've got a quick take on the right of the trial by jury and jury nullification from five leading founders. And then back to FIJA for four states that actually have jury nullification in their constitution. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. I broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. A quick programming note, this week, Friday, I guess that's April the 2nd, I will not be doing the live broadcast. I'm kicking it back. Uh, a day to Saturday at the same time, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, because tomorrow, the day that I have to prep, I'm going to do an interview over on the west side of town at Reason Magazine Studios regarding Second Amendment Preservation Acts being considered in the state. So again, no Fast Friday episode on Friday. It's going to be a Saturday edition this week. So go to our show homepage to get everything you need to follow this program. That's 10th Amendment Center com slash path to liberty all spelled out 10th amendment center.com slash path to liberty there you're going to find all the archives in the show for closing in on three years now on individual episodes like today's i will include a bunch of links that i'm covering in the episode so you can read in context and learn on your on your own time because i'm just scratching the surface you can find all the different platforms especially those of you who watch us live stream on the mainstream ones like youtube facebook twitch twitter and elsewhere, we're also on DLive, streaming live, hopefully on odyssey.com in the near future, although they're getting sued by the SEC, but the platform at library.tv should still be around. Uh, I don't. It's decentralized censorship resistance, so it doesn't matter what the government does. This will be an interesting test for what I've been talking about. But in case we're not on one of those platforms, we're on a bunch of other ones. We also put the archive over at minds.com, oftentimes over on MeWe. We're on Gab TV, Brighteon, BitChute, BitTube, again, Odyssey, Library, and elsewhere. And we have the podcast edition at Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podbean, and all the major ones. Again, the show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I want to say hello to a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat as we let people get another moment or two to get notifications to join us for the live stream. DHD Van Horn, Marcus in Wisconsin, Josh for Liberty in South Carolina. Good to see you, Josh. Dixie Strong, good to see you as well. Richard Banks in Fredonia, Kansas. Lawrence Smith in West Virginia, that Liberty gal in Dallas, Fort Worth. Actually, Fort Worth was the first ever, uh, well, second, I guess, technically, second nullification event that we ever hosted. This is back in like 2009 or 2010. Cool Place, Blue North Wind, Justin Lee, Dan Reed, Melody, Joe, Nathan, Kelly, Alan Mosley, who I did an awesome interview with for... Um, it's Too Late, his late night show, weekly late night show. Uh, I recorded that yesterday. I think it's getting released today. D.L. Neal, Brody, and everyone else. I know I'm missing a few people, but I really appreciate you being here. And I'll look through the comments a little later in the episode and again later on today to see if there's anything that I can reply to or if there are any ideas for future episodes. Because I figure I get at least half of them from your comments and your emails at team at 10th Amendment Center .com. Anyways, let's get right to this. And I want to start again. Like I pointed out, I want to start with Fully Informed Jury Association, F-I-J-A dot org. It's a great educational resource and it's a great activist resource if you're focusing on nullification through juries. It's a very, very niche area, but if you think about it, when all the other things that people have done, 
that have tried to protect the Constitution and the liberty of an individual have failed. And they do fail because government's got a lot of power. We live under the largest government in the history of the world, and the states don't really act as independent sovereignties anymore. They're really acting as corporations, as enforcement arms for that federal empire, that national imperial government in Washington, D.C. And when all the other things fail and someone is locked up in a cage and they're put on trial for something that, you know, maybe it's a, a victimless crime for possession of something like a firearm or a plant. And you actually have an opportunity sitting on a jury to say not just that whether or not the person violated the law that the government has thrown at us that they shouldn't in the first place in most situations, but absolutely that if the law is unjust. This is how FIJA, F-I-J-A dot org, describes jury nullification on their library and resource, their definitions page. They say in its strictest sense, Jury nullification occurs when a jury returns a not guilty verdict, even though jurors believe it has been proved beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the charged offenses. So even though it's been proven by the prosecution that the person violated the law on the books, the jury can still say, eh, not guilty. Going further at FIJA, because the not guilty verdict cannot be overturned and because the jurors cannot be punished for their verdicts, the law is said to be nullified in that particular case. On this website, and I actually just learned about this, I, maybe this has been gaining a little bit more popularity from them, we often refer to this as conscientious acquittal. Going a little further. They use the term, you can use the term more uh, loosely or widely. So jury nullification in its strict sense was just what I described. I'll get back to that acquittal uh, definition in a moment. But they say the term is also more loosely used to include a variety of related concepts. The most common such use is including under the umbrella of jury nullification a mistrial that results when a minority of jurors hang a jury with their not guilty votes, even though they believe it was proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the charged offense. So you have the most strict sense of jury nullification where the jury just says, no, we're returning not guilty, period. Then you get a mistrial version, which is kind of uh, not as, uh, it's not as absolute and final, but it's a hung jury where you've got a few people on the jury who say, well, not guilty, and it results in a hung trial, and that's the end of that. They say here, when there is a mistrial due to a hung jury, the prosecution may or may not retry the case in the future. So it's a good positive step. It kicks the thing down the line and it may end the case. But the law, they say, can be said to have at least been nullified in the trial at hand. And they also say, here's a third one. Jury nullification has also been used very informally to include a case where a jury couldn't even be seated. And I know a few years ago, few is probably an understatement at this point. As you get older, you notice how, like you say, oh, five years ago really meant 20. <laughs> but I'm noticing that more and more as I get close to 50 at this point. Anyways, jury nullification has been used very informally to include a case where a jury couldn't even be seated because so many people report during voir dire, dire, voir dire, I think is how you say it, that they would not convict someone for the offense charged. For example, a misdemeanor for possession of a tiny amount of marijuana. That actually happened in Montana. I'm not sure if it's still happening. I haven't been following the news on this enough. And uh, if you guys hear of jury nullification or jury nullification light or whatever, please email me about it. Team at 10th Amendment Center .com. I have found there is absolutely no way as so many things are going on to keep up with all this stuff just here with our small team at 10th Amendment Center. What we have been more and more relying on is you and the grassroots to give us updates on stuff happening, whether it's in your state or you, your community or not. If you just happen to come across something, send us an email. We probably will not reply to most of the emails, but we read through of them. And the more we read through all of them and the more information we get, the better equipped we can be to inform other people. So this happened in Montana some years ago where they couldn't. They just juror after juror or potential juror after potential juror just kept getting disqualified because they were saying, look, I, I'm not going to. I, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to vote to convict. And now I'm not sure if you really should be lying in that situation, but um, I used to always try to get out of uh, jury duty and I haven't been called back since. I know it would probably be, 
It would, it's an important thing to do. You have an opportunity to say no to the law on the books, not just to what the judge tells you what to do. And here's how Fiji describes conscientious acquittal. They, they say it's roughly interchangeably used with jury nullification. They say, while you will still frequently see that term, jury nullification in Fiji's work, we have several reasons for speaking of conscientious acquittal in addition to or in place of jury nullification. In fact, depending on who you're talking to, you might want to describe things differently. If it's the same end result and someone has kind of a visceral, like, hated response towards one word or another, some people might hate the term conscientious. Some people might hate the word nullification. Who cares? Describe it in whatever term works for the person you're communicating with. And I think this is a really smart approach. They say the term conscientious acqui acquittal stresses the importance of consulting one's conscience in arriving at a verdict rather than simply unthinkingly enforcing the law as instructed by the government. As I mentioned in the intro, I did an episode on this, a pretty good deep dive. This is actually one of my favorite episodes. I'm not sure if the quality of what I used to do back in 2019 is as good. And I know when I look at a couple of years from now that this quality is going to be garbage in comparison. But I think the information in this one is really good. Uh, trial by jury, defense against tyranny. I will link to that in the show notes at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. In that, I heavily cited one of the best articles, probably the best article ever written on trial by jury and jury nullification. Notice I'm not calling it jury trial. And I explain that through Lysander Spooner's great 1852 essay, Trial by Jury, the difference between trial by jury and jury trial. One, really, the trial is done by the jury. They have the final say. The other is really kind of trial by government under government rules, and that renders the whole point of it pretty much moot. I've also got articles that I cite in there by James Ostrowski over at Mises.org and my buddy Joe Wolverton, too. Anyways, here just a quick citation from Spooner. Here's how uh, Spooner describes things. Again, this is 1852, his essay, Trial by Jury, which is really the best thing I've ever read on this. There are probably people who would dispute that with me, but I love this. I love this article. I think it's fantastic. It's very clear. It's very straightforward. It's good reading. And it's for free over at the libertyfund.org website, which I will link to in the show notes. Oh, quick mention. If you want to help us spread the word, consider smashing the like, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Comments, of course, sharing links to the episode, all that stuff triggers the algorithm of platform you watch or listen, and primarily the uh, mainstream ones, and it tells that platform to show the program to more people. So I appreciate you guys doing all that stuff to help out. Anyways, here from Spooner. The jury must judge of and try the whole case and every part and parcel of the case free of any dictation or authority on the part of the government. That's one of the big differences between a trial by jury and just a jury trial that the government sits. No dictation, no, no authority on the part of the government. He goes on, he says, they must judge of the existence of the law, not just the facts of the case, of the true exposition of the law, of the justice of the law, and of the admissibility and weight of all the evidence offered. I like how he actually puts the evidence last. The government wants you to consider the evidence first because the government holds that its laws always should exist and should always be enforced to the fullest of their capability. And they want you, if you're on a jury, to do what they want done, which is prosecute. Otherwise, they wouldn't be wasting the time and Well, government does waste a lot of time and money, and they hurt a lot of people. Anyways, if you don't do all these things, again, the existence of the law, the exposition of the law, the justice of the law, and then the evidence. He says, otherwise, the government will have everything its own way. The jury will be mere puppets in the hands of the government, and the trial will be, in reality, a trial by the government and not a trial by the country. That oh, I'm sorry, I must have gotten the phrase wrong. Trial by the country is by the people of the country itself in that area. By such trials, he says, the government will determine its own powers over the people instead of the people's determining their own liberties against the government. And you've heard me say something similar to that many times. If you pay attention to our work here at TAC, I know you guys do. And that is, if you rely on the government to determine the extent of its own powers, you shouldn't be surprised when that power continues to grow, no matter which team is in charge, no matter what kind of checks and balances you have, as long as they determine the extent of their own powers, you will always have bigger and bigger government, 
And that's basically how people have treated things for a long time. And today we live under the largest government in the history of the world. So that uh, is some quick overview of trial by jury, of jury nullification, of conscientious acquittal, as Fija puts it. Now, here are five leading founders and their thoughts on the trial by jury and jury nullification, which is really hand in hand. Here's Thomas Jefferson in a letter to Thomas Paine. I think about this. I'm like, you know, you don't see a lot of letters from uh, you see a lot of Ma Madison and Jefferson letters, uh, Richard Henry Lee and Samuel Adams, people who you know are friends. And of course, they write to various other people. But I think it's pretty cool to see someone like Jefferson and Payne, which you don't see often hand in hand on stuff, on writings and things like that, communicating with, you, with each other. It'd be fascinating to imagine what it would be like if they were communicating on social media today. But anyways, here's Jefferson to Thomas Paine, July 11th, 1789. He says, I consider trial by jury as the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. Because if they're trying to prosecute people and they can't even seat a jury, or if they can't get anyone prosecuted, that means those laws, it's as if they don't exist. And that's why it's such a powerful tool. That's what Jefferson was having to say to Thomas Paine. Now, he covered it in a little bit more detail in his, I guess it would be very famous, at least at the time, Notes on the State of Virginia. This was originally written in 1781 with some revisions in 1782. And here's how he put it. He's talking about the division of labor between juries and judges. And he says the magistrates, that's the, uh, the judges, have jurisdiction both criminal and civil. If the question before them be a question of law only, they decide on it themselves. But if it be a fact or a fact and law combined, it must be referred to a jury. In the latter case of a combination of law and fact, it is usual for the jurors to decide the fact and to refer the law arising on it to the decision of the judges. Short version, when it comes to a trial by jury, when the jury has to consider it, they generally just, in most situations, he's saying, look, they're just deciding whether the facts of the case. Here's the law in the books. Did the person violate the law? Did they intend to? All that other stuff. And what should happen from there? If that's the general rule. And then the law arising act goes to the decision of the judges. He says, but this division of the subject lies with their discretion only. It's only if the jury wants to approach it like that. That's it. It is only their discretion. There is no rule compelling them to kick the can over to the judge in order to make the decision on the law itself. They can, if they want to, judge both the law and the facts of the case. He says, and if the question relate at any point to at any point of public liberty, and that's very important. He says, like, if prosecution under this law really affects the general public liberty, or I guess in this case, for me, I would say individual liberty. He says, or if it be one of those in which the judges may be suspected of bias all the time, the jury undertakes to decide both law and fact. And that's how Spooner was describing it some decades later, this law and fact. I guess it was almost a century when Spooner got to it. Now, here's the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. We're not just talking about uh, that wackadoo Thomas Jefferson. And I use wackadoo because there was a guy over at Esquire some years ago who, like, we, <laughs> there was a little back and forth in the blog section. They didn't like a documentary film that we had produced. And we cited Jefferson a lot. And he's like, well, of course, Jefferson was just a wackadoo. And that's, the, that's what they'll say. If they ever get pushed into a corner where they don't like something, they'll just start calling people racist or crazy or evil or an outlier or whatever it may be that just try to dismiss them. But here's the first chief justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay. He was appointed to be there by President George Washington, who was no Jeffersonian when you really get down with, to it. And neither was John Jay. And he, uh, this was in a 1794, very famous Supreme Court opinion. And this is a paraphrase. He says, the jury has a right to judge both the law as well as the fact in controversy. Now, I would say beyond a right, they actually have a duty to do that, to always consider it. The way Spooner described it, you really, you're not even getting to the fact until the bottom. And in essence, that's basically how John Jay is saying here. I don't think he's being as forceful, but here is, here's the full quote. He says, on questions of fact, it is the province of the jury. On questions of law, it is the province of the court to decide. 
But it must be recognized that by the same law, which recognizes this reasonable distribution of jurisdiction, you have, and this was he's talking to the jury, you have nevertheless a right to take upon yourself to judge of both and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. That's John Jay, first chief justice of the Supreme Court. And here from another uh, Supreme Court justice, I think he was like the third one appointed by by uh, George Washington. This is James Wilson, and he's often cited as an opponent of nullification. And I think it was more of kind of a, he's basically, he was kind of one of the bigger, big government guys of the time. He was very influential on ratification of the Constitution. I think he did a lot of important stuff, but if I were to have a one-on-one -on -one with him, there'd be a lot of stuff I disagree with. And he's often recognized or pointed to as being kind of an opponent, but I think he also made the case for jury nullification. This was from, I think it was like a law lecture or a, some kind of instructional thing back in 1790. I know it was 1790, again, from Liberty Fund, from the collected works of James Wilson, volume two. He says, suppose that after all the precautions taken to avoid it, a difference of sentiment takes place, place between the judges and the jury with regard to a point of law. Suppose the law and the fact to be so closely interwoven that a determin of, determination of one must at the same time embrace the determination of another. So sometimes he's saying once in a while, not that it's a duty to do it all the time, but he's like, sometimes this might happen. He says, suppose a matter of this description to come in trial before a jury. What must the jury do? Do. The jury must do their duty, their whole duty. They must decide the law as well as the fact. That's James Wilson, a strong Federalist. Some people would actually call him the father of the Constitution rather than James Madison because he was so influential. And he was also appointed to the Supreme Court by President George Washington. And here's John Adams, another Federalist. Back in 1771, February or so, in his own personal diary. Here he is talking about these types of things as well. He says, it is not only the juror's right, but his duty in the case to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscious, conscience, though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. So again, rejecting what the court orders and decide on one's own conscience. And I like how Fija talks about this as based on one's own conscience, because we can go all the way back to, uh, to John Adams talking about it in that way as well. My favorite quote ever on jury nullification comes from Theophilus Parsons, because it's kind of like a one, two, three punch talking about what happens when the federal government goes beyond the limits of its of the Constitution? This was in the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention in early 1788, sometime late January. I think it was 22nd or 23rd in the debates. Parsons was basically like one of the leading lawyers in Massachusetts. He was a Federalist in support of ratification. He was a great speaker. Even one of his opponents talked about like, you know, if I could just convince you to be on my side, I know we'd win. And that's kind of the, the mentality. He was one of the greatest speakers of the time. We often think of great speakers as being people like Patrick Henry, but there were others. Theophilus Parsons was one of them. And they were talking about, well, what happens when the federal government itself oversteps the limits of the Constitution? He says, well, the people themselves have it in their power effectually to resist usurpation. Of course, usurpation is an exercise of power not delegated to the government and the Constitution. He says they can effectually resist usurpation without being driven to an appeal to arms. You don't need to get into fighting when the government goes beyond the lines of the Constitution. He goes on, he says, an act of usurpation is not obligatory. It is not law. And any man may be justified in his resistance. Anyone can resist an act that is outside the Constitution morally. He's talking about justification, moral, philosophical, and based on principles, based on the Constitution itself. Anyone is justified in that. He says, let him be considered as a criminal by the general government. Yet only his fellow citizens can convict him. This is clearly a situation of jury nullification because even if the federal or the general government, as the founders called it, especially during ratification, were considering someone a criminal for violating an act that the government shouldn't have been doing in the first place, only his fellow citizens can convict him. They are his jury. And if they pronounce him innocent, not all the powers of Congress can hurt him. And innocent, they certainly will pronounce him if the supposed law he resisted was an act of usurpation. Now, 
I don't think the general public is as on top of it as far as resisting and opposing and the limits of federal power in the Constitution. So that, I think, is a bit outdated, may have been more appropriate for the people of the time, but the process still remains. Again, the philosophical foundation that when government violates the Constitution, whether on a state or a federal level, and we're talking about state and federal constitutions, when government goes beyond its limits, the people are not bound to obey them. We can go all the way back to the resistance to the Stamp Act. We know that people like John Dickinson, John Adams, Patrick Henry, and so many others took the same mentality. John Hancock as well. The people have the right and the moral standing to be able to be opposed to these things. But then when you add during nullification, it renders the government power mostly impotent. Now, of course, you're in a pretty bad situation if you're going to trial. You've probably been arrested and things like that, but it's not but you can actually nullify these acts in the courtroom. And then I also pointed out at the beginning, I wanted to mention four states that actually have jury nullification in their constitution. This is again from FIJA, F-I-J-A dot org, their library and resources section. I will link to this specifically in the show notes. There are four states that specifically talk about the power of a trial by jury and jury nullification in their state constitution. And they put it this way, the constitutions of Maryland, Indiana, Oregon, and Georgia currently have provisions guaranteeing the right of jurors to judge or determine the law in all criminal cases. For example, Article 23, Declaration of Rights in the Constitution of Maryland. They say, the jury shall be the judges of law as well as of fact. That's in criminal cases. Article 1, Section 19, Constitution of Indiana. The jury shall have the right to determine the law and the facts. Article 1, Section 16 of the Constitution of Oregon, in all criminal cases, whatever, the jury shall have the right to determine the law and the facts. Article 1, Section 1, Paragraph 11, Constitution of the State of Georgia, the jury shall be the judges of the law and of the facts. They say these constitutional jury nullification provisions endure despite decades of hostile judicial interpretation. Well, this is just kind of a brief kind of introduction to what's going on, uh, a kind of a reminder that we need to be thinking about trial by jury, about jury nullification, because no matter what type of other nullification efforts we get, some stuff's going to slip through the cracks and government continues to aggressively try to prosecute. And the more that you ban the use of resources for the enforcement of something on a, federal, on a state and local level, some federal act, the more that the federal government will act like a caged animal, a wild beast, and try to scare people off by reallocating, taking some resources from one state and pushing it to another in order to scare people off. And this can be a very powerful tool in the overall strategy to help push back on that. Going to take a quick look over in the live chat and see if there's any brief questions that I can get to or, or comments. Here's Blue North Wind. The jury is part of the due process in the court system. To be judged by our peers has more powerful than the judge or law. If the peers determine arbitrary, it shall be so. Amanda says, just join the civics team. Amanda Lamb, Squire Lamb. This civics teacher is super excited. Awesome. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you joining in with us. Thank you so much. Uh, let me take a look. Uh, Sergeant Squirtle says the fact that over 90% of cases, I think it's actually like 98%. I was reading through some things over uh, as I was doing research for this episode. They never make it to trial is a demonstration of how illegitimate the so-called justice system has become. Uh, yeah, the prosecution process is really just awful. And I think it is like 98 or 98 and a half percent. I don't really know. Clay Kent ad hominem is losing the debate. I guess there's uh, some interesting argument going on here. Clay also says government is the king of fraud, waste and abuse of our stolen tax money. Yeah, that's kind of redundant, stolen and tax. And I want to say hi to uh, Bob Landry, who joined in a little bit late. Patricia Dance and Erwin Havernick says smash the algorithm. Josh for Liberty gives uh, another second to Spooner's trial by jury. He says it is fantastic. All caps. I agree. Well, I will look more in the uh, comments a little bit later today. Please continue leaving those comments, whether it's live right now or a little bit later on in the archive. The archive comments actually help the algorithm a little bit more. So uh, a thoughtful comment and some feedback really helps out and it gives me a lot of ideas too for future episodes. Of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work. There is absolutely nothing that helps us roll up our sleeves and get this work done more every single day than the financial support of our members. It starts out as little as two bucks a month. I see a bunch of you guys out here. I'm not going to dox anybody, but I couldn't be more grateful for your support. Two dollars a month and up 
tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. You know what to do. That's all spelled out, tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. Reminder, no Friday show. It will be on Saturday morning, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time for the Fast Friday, Saturday edition this week. Uh, I appreciate you being here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you then here on the path to liberty.